what's called the first moment of area. I can't remember if I actually used that term. Um, it came, if you remember, we had to set up the moment part when we were trying to figure out the equivalent of a, of a, a, a load that we were trying to place. We had uh, this kind of equation. Um, oh no, we had the, the uh, we had W in there. We had X times the load curve dx over the entire area under the load curve. I remember we, uh, Les, you came up with that I think two days ago or something. Maybe last Friday we did that. But then uh, for situations like we have uh, where we are looking at planar solids of consistent density and thickness, then the load term, which is, is actually a, a weight per unit length of uh, the load distribution. Well, the, the weight term has the has G in it, also has M in it, um, and those divided out top and bottom, and we were left with just doing this based on the area. However, we even took it a little step farther because we had nice regular solids, and this became uh, that by the uh, end of class on uh, on Monday before the big hurricane hit, and we all went running home scared to death with the big babies. All right, and so that, that took us, th this actually, this little piece here, is actually what is the first moment of area, that, that little piece. But it was just part of, of everything we were using. Now, uh, we're going to need uh, a little bit more than that uh, for what we're going to do next term. And we're not going to really need it this term. Uh, if given some load on a beam, the beam will tend to deflect. So we're not going to be doing beam deflections until next term. However, what we need to do the beam deflections is just one step beyond this. So we're going to introduce it now so that I don't have to redo it next term and we can just get to the beam deflection stuff itself. The, the beam deflection depends upon a couple things. Uh, some of them you'll remember. Young's modulus might remember that. Uh, I think we just hit that in physics one. It, it tells us uh, essentially how elastic solids are. It's really uh, very much the same as the spring constant. Uh, for springs that we looked at in physics one. Well, like we're talking about elastic solids such that when we remove the load, they spring back to where they were before, very much like springs do. Uh, depends also upon the moment applied to the beam. In this case, I showed it as just two point loads, but that's causing the beam to feel internal moments that cause it to do that, and that's what's causing the bending. We'll look that at that, the, the internal forces in uh, a couple days. We've been looking at the external forces, then we looked a little bit at internal forces and trusses, but we're going to do it in more uh, other types of beams if we get things going here in a little bit. And then it also depends upon the cross-sectional area not just the total area, but actually the shape of the area. Once we have all those things, we'll be able to look at things like the beam displacement, how far down the beam deflects due to a particular load. In simplest terms, you're going to need that because if you have a load, uh, if people come into a room 
and the room sags and the wall separates because the wall the floor sags so much and then the wall falls down kills all the people then the police have to come in and drag the bodies out and then there's more people in there there's more deflection and then the police get killed and it just goes in forever and it's worse than a hurricane believe it or not as bad as a hurricane can be so to evaluate this part of it the cross-sectional part we need what's called the second moment of area And it's actually this same integral, however, with an extra, extra power on it. And so we can, uh, you can integrate that through the, uh, through the piece like that. And uh, uh, we can do that in either direction. And integrate over the whole area and this is also known as the area moment of inertia and so has the symbol I uh, the Y means it's in the uh, Y direction so we take the X integral and this one is the X so we do it in the, the integral in the Y direction Okay, we're we're gonna well we're not gonna do a big deal with those because again it's just exercises in integration, and if you remember from that table I showed you, where a lot of the centroids were labeled, it also had the moments of inertia in the particular direction. So it's more useful for us to actually just use it than it is for us to uh, to spend too much time integrating it. So we'll just run through it once for a simple rectangular cross-section beam. So this is some kind of beam, looks like that in cross-section. It's this cross-section that we're interested in because it's that cross-section, not only its size but its shape and of course the material uh, used for the beam itself there's going to tell us how much deflection there's going to be in these beams. So that's a little bit of what we're heading to uh, later in the term. Alright, so we'll just run through this once for a simple uh, rectangular beam just to, just to step through the exercise of it. Okay, give it some dimensions here. Um, we'll call that B for base, H for height. That's the that's the the uh, the bulk size of the cross section of the beam itself. And we can do that integration. We'll take a a little into elemental strip. of thickness dy at some position y. And then we can do that integral to get started. Just to run through it once. And that will give us the moment of inertia with respect to the x-axis. It's different uh, for different axes. As you can imagine, because if you've got uh, two by four you're using as a beam and you stack it like that on your deck it has a very different response than if you turned it sideways and put it like that on your deck in terms of how it's going to bend you know that just from just from, well if nothing else you can go play around with the uh, the meter sticks over there they respond very differently when held like that than they do when held like that and all that's changed there is the moment of inertia because you've turned the axis. Once you've turned the axis, like we did here, then the moment of inertia changes and 
the response of the beam then changes as simple as that. So we'll integrate over the area y squared dA. Just to just to run through it once. So we're integrating from uh, zero to h over two. Actually, from minus h over two to plus h over two. So we have to do the whole beam in the y direction. So that's from down here, integrating all the way to up there, y squared, and then dA, the area of that little elemental strip, is B dy. That sound about right? And then that's an integration we can do. B remembers a constant, that's the thickness of the beam that comes out. Then we have y squared integration, so we're doing y cubed between minus h over 2 and plus h over 2, we're trying to kind of squeeze it in there. Is that right for the integration of that? And then we can fill in the little pieces there. We've got the limits now. We just cube them. A bunch of stuff cancels. And it reduces to BH cubed over 12. Not to belabor the integration. Now, this is actually a special moment of inertia because it was respect with respect to an axis, respect to the x-axis, that actually goes through the centroid. So I think our, our book tends to put a um, big bar over that. And that means uh, x axis through the central. <clears throat> That's important because uh, uh, not terribly important to us yet, other than we need to learn it, but it will be very important to us when we look at how these beams respond to lows uh, when we get to 209 next term because uh, there's a lot of important stuff actually in terms of the load interior to the beam and that's what ends up tearing beams apart that uh, happens with respect to the centroid. So we're going to need that uh, plus some other things. Okay, one other little piece we need, boy there's all kinds of boring uh, integrations we can do but we're not going to do them. We just did that one exciting one there. Um, and if you turn the beam sideways and use uh, the same variable B, H there, and redo the integration, with respect to a different beam. So that's just taking this same thing, turning it sideways. You'll then get very much the same thing, only the H and the B have switched. So for simple rectangular shapes, we're going to have to pay attention to that, which, which is the B, which is the H, just to make sure we get the values right. But we don't ever need to do that integration again. It's right there in the uh, table in the book, along with a whole bunch of regular solids and areas like uh, triangles and the like. One thing we will need, though, is what's known as the parallel axis theorem. need this, and we'll go through this example in a second as we work it out, but the reason we're going to, the reason why we'll need that is, for example, we're going to look at 
I-beams. And you've all heard of I-beams, but we're going to figure out for ourselves why we use I-beams. So if we look at uh, the moment of inertia of this cross-sectional shape, the cross-sectional shape of an I-beam, with respect to some axis through its centroid, you know by symmetry that the centroid of this shape is going to be right there. We still know, need to know the moment of inertia with respect to that axis of the entire shape. we will need the moment of inertia with respect to the x-axis for a compound shape. It's pretty easy in that we just take all the individual shapes, find out their moments of inertia, and add them up. So if we divide it up, we can divide maybe that, call that shape one, this uh, web part shape 2, and this piece down here is shape 3. The trouble is, these individual moments of inertia are with respect to lines through their own centroids. But the line we're interested in is down here, some distance away. We know the individual moments of inertia of just rectangular shape. Heck, we just did it. But that was with respect to an axis through its own centroid there. This one's okay. It happens to lie right on the centroid of the entire shape. This one, however, has yet another line. And so to add up these, we need to look at the moments of inertia with respect to the axis of interest. Even though the moment of inertia we've got in the table is about a separate axis entirely. But we can handle that by using the parallel axis theorem. Since these two axes are parallel, the axis of interest for this shape and the axis for the subshape that we've got on the book since those are parallel, well, there we go with the first part of it, parallel axis theorem, we can figure out the moment of inertia of this shape that is off of the axis of interest, but parallel to it. All we need is the distance between those two d. So we find the moment of inertia of a subpiece X. So we'll do it here for one. It's, it works out the same for any of the solids uh, that we're going to look at. We take the moment of inertia of that shape with respect to its own centroid. Remember that's what that bar over the top means when the axis of interest actually goes through the centroid of the shape. So. That's uh, that's what we've got up here. Maybe I can, maybe we can we can do this. Uh, we'll call this uh, we'll call this x, and we'll call this one x prime. So this will be the moment of inertia of shape one with respect to x prime. Does that help a little bit, or does that make it worse? With, with practice, you'll. Uh, you'll be able to get a little uh, handle on this. And we're going to work with very regular solids, uh, nice rectangular shapes, uh, on very uh, well-known distances apart. But we have to account for the fact that the uh, centroidal moment of inertia, this I bar, is displaced from the axis of interest which is the centroidal axis of the entire shape, not just the little subshape. And we deal with that by simply adding on a factor of a d squared, where a is uh, the area of that piece uh, of the subpiece, piece one. 
and D is the distance that piece is away. Because we might have other pieces that are other distances away. All right, maybe, uh, maybe we, it'd help if we just work through some numbers as an example on, uh, on just how to do this. So let's put some dimensions up there and just work through the numbers. And then we'll also do another one to see why it matters. So we'll say this is 200 millimeters across the top there. The flange has a thickness of 40. That's what the uh, wide parts are on the side there. And the thickness of the web, that's that uh, vertical piece there, is 40. And the overall height of the beam, we'll just call it even 200, top to bottom. Okay, so that gives us all the pieces. And then we want to find out the moment of inertia of that beam. Well, first thing you do is look in the book and see if it's there, but it's not. So we have to do it. Not a big deal. Again, it kind of helps if we make a table out of this, because we have a lot of things to keep track of. We've got three pieces here. We're going to need the moment, the centroidal moment of inertia of each one. But they're just nice regular rectangles. We'll be able to get that right out of the book. So that'll be I bar I. We'll get that right out of the book. If somebody has their book here. If not, I can run and get mine. Who's my lovely assistant for the day? I do. There you go. I think I push the button so many times it doesn't know whether I want it on or not. There we go. Oh, there's my lovely assistant. <laughs> lovely. Thank you, Mr. Rex. All right, so we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a second. We're also going to need the area of each piece, the distance between the two parallel axes describing the pieces and the problems. And then we can add those three things across as I plus 80 squared. And then that's then what we sum to get the new moment of inertia of the whole piece. And then we'll, we'll redo that a little bit uh, uh, quickly just to make sure, uh, just to show why it matters. All right, so the moment of inertia for the, for the big pieces, or for the, for the sub pieces, let's see, I think that was table D. Yeah, there we go, right there. There's, there's the thing we need right there. A rectangular solid. And we're looking at it with respect to the x-axis going through the centroid. So it's, it's actually oriented just exactly like we've got here. So we know that for the first piece, B is 200 and H is 40. So we can figure out I, X, or through the centroid, same thing we've got here, BH cubed over 12. So that's 1 12th, and B is the 200, and the H cubed is 440 cubed. That how you read it? For that, that that's for piece number one. And so whatever that number comes out to be, uh, I don't happen to have it there, so we can do it. And then of course A, the area is 200 by 40. What's D? We have the moment of inertia of this first solid one through its own centroid, which is right down the middle where I've drawn it. So 
it, uh, let's see, uh, that's 100. Then we come halfway down, that's minus 20, so that's 80. Oh, and we can put in here units. This is millimeters corded. This is millimeters squared. And that's just millimeters. These numbers, we get lots of zeros in here, so you generally have to make sure you have lots of room. And that gives us the moment of inertia of that subpiece one with respect to the axis down here, because that was where uh, that was. That's what we're looking for, and that's where D uh, is from. So what's that come out to be? The one twelve two hundred times forty Q plus a D squared. So now who's my lovely assistant? Let's see if we get the same thing. Okay. 52.3 times 10 to the 6th units. The units work out. Uh, millimeters to the 4th for I, we're adding to it millimeters squared times millimeters squared millimeters to the fourth. So that makes that work out. Millimeters to the fourth. Now, notice piece three is exactly the same. Same shape, same orientation, same distance away, and it doesn't matter that it's negative because it's d squared. So piece three we already have done. 52.3 times 10 to the sixth as well. So we just copied those straight down from piece one. No sense doing those again. Alright, take a second and do piece two and uh, see if we all get the same thing because uh, we have to be a little bit careful with it. See if you get the same thing for piece two and then we'll run through it. And if that comes out right, then we simply add them all up. We have the moment of inertia for the very same, uh, for, for that total high beam shape. And you can set this stuff up on spreadsheets if you're just trying to run through a couple variations on thicknesses and lengths and the like. Of interest 
is through this centroid of that piece anyway, so that's zero. And so that comes out to be Five point eight times ten to the sixth. Um, try to try to keep the same exponents. Just makes it a lot easier to add those things together. Um, it's a bit traditional to keep multiples of three. It's called engineering notation. I think your calculators all have that setting engineering notation. That's where the exponents on the scientific notation are multiples of three. You don't need that anymore because you all have calculators to do this. But when we were first doing slide rules, when we multiply things, we multiply the first parts and then we have to add up the exponents to figure out uh, what the power of 10 was. And it's just a lot easier if it was everything was in powers of 3. Just less chance of making an error is all that was. So I tend to do this just because I learned on a slide rule when I was a baby student. And most of you, unless you've been in my office, don't even know what a slide rule is or how big they were and we used to have to carry around. Alright, so uh, add these up we get what? <clears throat> 110.3, something like that times 10 to the 6th millimeters cubed uh, to the 4th. And what's the total area come out to be? Two of those, one of those, 20,800. 20, and that's of course <coughs> millimeters squared. All right, the, as we're going to see in some detail next term, the greater this moment of inertia, the greater the resistance of the beam to being bent, to deflecting. So take a second, it won't take you more than a minute or two. Now let's leave that just for reference sake and redo it, find the moment of inertia of a square beam, 142.2 millimeters on the side. Why is that dimension useful? This beam has the same area as this beam. So there's just as much material if we were making this out of a couple boards nailed together, then we could make a beam, same shape, I mean, same, same cross-sectional area, just as much wood, it would weigh just the same if we put it into a square instead. But now what's the moment of inertia of that beam? And that's easy, since it's a rectangular shape and we're looking for the moment of inertia right through its own centroid. It's 1 12th. BH cubed, but B equals H, so it's just B to the fourth, where that's 144. Material weighs about the same, 
well, there's greater construction costs. We've got to put this beam together. We have to have to make sure that whatever attaches it there, whether it's glued and screwed or nailed or welded or what, we have to pay attention to that. Uh, but and, and also it's a higher beam, so you have to take into account that. That can add to the overall height of the building if you have several floors of those. But you get a moment of inertia that's three times what the simple rectangular beam is. And so that's why we use I-beams. It has to do with all of this area that is some distance away from the centroidal moment, uh, the centroidal axis. It's the fact that all of this area, well, on one and three, is pushed that distance away, and that distance gets squared. That's what increases the, uh, the resistance of this kind of beam to bend. That's why we use um, I-beams in construction. That's exactly why. And we're going to look at that in real detail. So if you've forgotten that by February or March, next spring, don't even come to class anymore. We'll, we'll, we'll do some more of these, but uh, I can't go over the basics of it all again. We just have to do it for a refresher then. So now we're learning the basics. And now you need a problem of your own. So this one, I went to the hardestproblemever.com and this was the fourth on the list. The one through three I went over with uh, my math students. Okay, do the, oh wait, wrong way. All right, there you go. Oh, what you, there, and there's the Y and the X axis. So, I want you to just come up with the moment of inertia of that. Now that could be the type of beam you'd want if you have uh, coax cables or pipes or something running down. The type of thing you might make out of concrete, uh, then reinforced concrete. So figure that out with, uh, with respect to the two axes shown. I, X, and I Y about the uh, about these ends, and uh, just to keep things useful for all of us, so we can all refer to the same things. Let's agree on a uh, division of the subparts. By let's agree, I mean do what I say. So so we'll, we'll have a democratic vote on this. And we'll what I say. All right, so there's there's the shape. Something like that. And we'll agree on the subshapes as I don't know how to draw this. Uh, we'll take the whole square as shape one. Just for making the table, just for reference sake is all. And then you'll want to subtract from that. And remember, uh, it's the same thing we looked at. You just give it a negative area. We'll subtract from that piece two, three, four, and five. Oh, no. Just to keep it straight with my notes. So we can look at other way around. Three, four, and five. Okay, so that'll be our subshapes that we'll, uh, we'll look at. Okay, so the, the internal webs there are all six millimeters. So you got all the shapes you need there. All right, so let's see what we get with that one. So make a table. Each one has its own B and H in it. Some of them 
I guess all of them. All of them need the parallel axis theorem. Each of their own moments of inertia, inertia now is just the 112th BH cubed. So no tricks there. And then you need them, the uh, D for each of them based upon an axis across the bottom of X. And then if we do it uh, with respect to the Y axis too. Turns out we need we need both at times when we don't have uh, loads that are straight down in the y direction. If we only have a load in the y direction, we only need i x for any of these beams. So if the beam is crooked or the load is crooked, then we need both. No. What are we doing in here? 
next direction? No. Yeah. The axis of interest is down oh, here. Down there. So it's the distance between that and the centroid of the individual part. For here would be there. For two would be there. And for the whole piece, right across the, the middle somewhere. Don't forget, for the missing pieces, I is negative and A is negative. And the D doesn't matter because it gets squared. So, uh, piece one. D is 22. Piece two is 10. And for the other three pieces, what, 16 plus 6 is 22. Got that in the sense. I don't know. Got a 6 is over and they're all centered. Yeah, they are. They're all centered. So they're the same. <coughs> yeah, so that makes sense. All you need to do now is just be careful. No, no not being careful. Yeah, everything. 
changes. Well, you can use B and H, B, you just have to switch it with the H, Q. Exact on these because uh, we do build in a huge factor of safety in the end, but we don't want to be wildly off either. Uh, maybe you do on the We like to be wildly off. Like 1.4 million. 